Our body is fighting a constant battle against bacteria, virus, and other pathogens to avoid infection. When an organism is capable of defending itself against a pathogen, it's said to have immunity. There are two main types of immunity, innate or nonspecific, and acquired or specific. As its name suggests, nonspecific immunity involves strategies that defend us from all pathogens, not minding who they are. Our first line of defense against disease are the natural barriers. The most important of those is the skin that serves as a physical barrier. For pathogens that manage to avoid skin, we have special strategies like mucus in the nose and respiratory system, saliva in our mouth, acid in our stomach, and wax in our ear. If a pathogen somehow manages to get around those barriers, our body has an army of white blood cells ready to deploy. Some of them, nonspecific, are cells that specialize in eating or engulfing pathogens, regardless of who they are. They are called phagocytes, after the Greek to eat or to devour. Although phagocytes do a pretty good job at being a regular army, some pathogens require the special forces to be called. Those special forces target specific pathogens, and as such, they are part of our specific or acquired immunity. All pathogens, like this bacteria, contain specific proteins in their surface that are unique to that type of pathogen. They are like passports, and they are called antigens. Our acquired immune system is capable of detecting those antigens and creating antibodies. They work as sort of machines that when in contact with a certain antigen, they emit a signal that alerts the body that that pathogen with this sort of passport is present and that it needs to be eliminated by white blood cells. A basic principle of a specific immunity is that a certain antibody is only capable of binding to one type of antigen. So, for example, an antibody to Ebola virus is only capable of binding to the Ebola antigen and therefore can only eliminate Ebola and not other diseases. There are two main ways in which we, as humans, can get new antibodies. The first of them is passive immunity, and it involves getting the antibodies already created and ready to go. Examples of this include breastfeeding and through the placenta. Those are ways in which a child can get immunity to a certain disease through antibodies that were previously done by his or her mother. Another way is through antibodies made in laboratories by doctors. We call those monoclonal antibodies or immunoglobulin. They are administered like medicine. The other way to get antibodies is by making them yourself. This is called active immunity. The main way to, of developing active immunity is by getting sick. When you get sick and exposed to a pathogen for the first time, your body learns to make antibodies for that disease and stores information on that antigen, so that next time you are exposed to it, you make antibodies so quickly you manage to eliminate the pathogen before getting sick. If only there was a way to develop antibodies to a certain disease without getting sick. But there is, and they are called vaccines. The main principle of vaccines is injecting your body with a certain antigen without having to expose it to the complete infection-capable pathogen. Vaccines are very special because if you got sick by some of the pathogens they protect for, the infection would be deadly before your body is even able to make antibodies for it. Now let's do a practical activity about antigens and antibodies involving blood types. Red blood cells are in charge of delivering oxygen to our tissues, and they are the primary blood cell. Their cell surface is full with many proteins, or antigens, that help identify different characteristics about them. We group those antigens to better identify them. The ABO and rhesus, or RH, groups are the most important and widely used red blood cell antigen groups. The ABO group of antigens is what determines our blood type. A, B, AB, or O. It is made up of two main antigens, the A antigen and the B antigen. When a person's red blood cells contain only the A antigen in their surface without the B antigen, they are said to be type A blood. When a person's red blood cells only contain the B antigen and do not have the A antigen, they are said to be blood type B. 
When red blood cells contain both antigens in their surface, A and B, the person is type AB. And when neither A nor B antigen are present, the person's blood type is O. A few things to consider. When we say a person is type A blood, all of the red blood cells in their body will have the A antigen and will not have the B antigen. Also, because that person was born with the A antigen in his or her red blood cells, the body is used to it, so it can receive blood from another person that has A antigen in their red blood cells. But if that body receives type B blood, it will identify the B antigen as an unknown foreign substance and a threat to your body security, and it will coagulate or thick blood with the help of antibodies. As you can imagine by now, people with type AB blood have immune systems that are used to both A antigen and B antigen, and because of that they can receive blood transfusions from any person, type A, type B, type AB, and type O. On the contrary, people with type O blood have neither A antigen nor B antigen, so they cannot receive blood from anyone except another type O person that has no ABO group antigen in the red blood cell surface. The rhesus or RH group has only one antigen, the RH antigen. If your red blood cells have that antigen, you are said to be positive, and if they don't, you are said to be negative. When we talk about a person's blood type, we mention their ABO group and their RH group as such. A positive. AB negative, O positive. There is one fun way in which we can determine a person's blood type, and that is through ABO on RH antibody substances. In this activity, we are able to determine a certain person's ABO on RH blood group. We use three substances, one that contains antibodies against the A antigen, called anti-A, one with antibodies to the B antigen, called anti-B, and one with antibodies to the RH antigen, called anti-RH. In a surface, we place one drop of each antibody substance side by side, but separated from each other. Next up, we mix one drop of blood from the subject whose blood type we are trying to figure out with each antibody substance. Let's imagine this person has type A blood. His or her red blood cells would have the A antigen in their surface. So when in contact with the anti-A solution, the anti-A antibodies would bind to the A antigen and group red blood cells tightly together, making blood clot and making that drop look clunky and clump together. In contrast, because anti-B antibodies do not bind to the A antigen, the second drop would look like a mixture of the solution and blood, without any clumps. The same principle would apply to the RH antigen. So next up, try to figure out the blood type for this group of subjects.